All right, we are recording. Let us talk about entropy. You guys all see in my screen now, I assume. Yep. Okay, so entropy. So previously we've been talking about enthalpy or delta H. Okay, what does enthalpy tell us? It's the heat, right? Yeah, and so um, it tells us if it's endothermic or exothermic. Now, there's only like four of you on this call or five of you on this call. So if you're down to just unmute yourself, um, if there's stuff going on around you, no big deal. But if you're willing to just unmute yourself, that'll be cool. All right, so this tells, Delta H tells us if something is endothermic or exothermic which is good to know. But really what we're trying to get down to is figuring out whether or not something is gonna actually happen or not. Okay, so that's, that's one thing that thermodynamics, uh, one of the important things that thermodynamics teaches us is to figure out will a process occur or not. Okay, so, so um, the word we use for that is spontaneous or not spontaneous. Whoa. Non-spontaneous. And it turns out that saying something is endothermic or exothermic is not enough because typically we say things like to get to a low energy state, right? The lower the energy state, the better. Okay. In which case, and this is the example Dr. Aspen said, in which case water would just always freeze, right? Because ice is always a lower energy state than, it's like solid is always lower energy state than liquid. So it's not enough to know that it's at a low like heat state. Um, and that brings in the idea of entropy, or I'm just going to write S for entropy. So what is entropy a measure of? What does entropy measure in? It's like chaos. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it, right? People like to talk about it as in, it's like a measure of disorder, how disorganized things are. Um, uh, it's a measure of um, how dispersed energy is. Okay, so um, yes, so that's what entropy is measuring. And the second law of thermodynamics, what does the second law of thermodynamics say? Is that the one where it's energy can't be created or destroyed? So that's is the that first the law. Oh, that's the first one. Oh, no. So change in energy of the universe is equal to zero, okay? So what's the second law? It's okay if nobody knows, but if somebody uh, knows. Energy can't be created or destroyed. That's the first law again. The second law is that the total change in entropy of the universe has to be greater than zero. Another way to say that is entropy is always increasing. The amount of disorder of things is always increasing. Energy is always dispersing out more. Okay, so an example of that would be if I took food coloring and dropped it in a cup of water, in no universe, at no time ever, would that food coloring, like, or let's say I dropped it in and I mixed it up so that everything is, you know, all the water is red. Okay, in no universe would that um, food coloring come back together and form a single droplet right? Because things are always going to a more disordered state. The entropy of the universe is always greater than zero. Does that make sense the way I explain that? So another example that I like is if I took a, a stack of papers and threw them up in the air, what's the chance that they're going to land perfectly stacked up? Probably not ever going to happen, right? I could throw it as many times as I want and they're probably never going to land stacked up perfectly again. But um, they're more likely to spread out. Now, why is it that things always tend to move to a state of disorder? Why does that happen? We talked about it on, what's today, Friday? So we talked about it on Wednesday. I know that these last two lectures have probably been quite confusing for everyone. Um, it has to do with probability. So if I were to oh. take, okay, is that, 
Ring is that one like he went over all the math like well if i have two billion molecules what's yeah, the probability yeah, yeah, yeah. they're all on one side of the perfect so let's take their stack of papers if i take my stack of papers and i throw them up in the air and they all spread out is it like feasible is there any like anything physically stopping them from stacking up again no like they could land that way but how many ways could they land perfectly stacked up the way they were before like, there's really only one way to do that but how many ways could they be spread out all over the place? A lot. Like a lot, okay? Borderline infinite, right? So just statistically, probability-wise, what's going to happen? When I throw the papers up in the air, statistically, the way they're going to land is going to be spread out and, and disordered, okay? So that's why entropy of the universe is always increasing. It's, it's like a statistical law. There's just more ways to be disordered than there are to be ordered. And because when we're dealing with molecules, we're dealing with, you know, 10 to the 23rd plus number of molecules, statistics pretty much is perfect with that many molecules, okay? All right, does that kind of make sense, the way I, the way I explain that? Things tend to get more disordered statistically. And that's the second law of thermodynamics. So, and I should add something on here. The delta S of the universe is greater than zero for spontaneous process. Okay. So that leads us to um, talking about what does it mean to be spontaneous? Anybody got a good definition of spontaneous? It's like how a reaction occurs, it'll occur naturally. Like uh -huh. it wants to happen kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Awesome. So if I, um, I like your definition better than the textbook definition, but I'm going to tell the de te textbook definition because that could be a multiple choice question. So the textbook says, a spontaneous process is something that once started continues independent of any like addition of energy. If that makes sense. So once it started, it just goes. Okay. A better definition, which is what Catherine said is a spontaneous process is something that happens. I know that seems simple and stupid, but that's what it means. So spontaneous things happen. Non-spontaneous things don't happen. So an example of a spontaneous process, I take water, I put it in the freezer. So does water in the freezer freeze? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. So that's spontaneous. Water in a freezer freezes. Okay. Does water on um, a hot stove freeze? No. So that's not spontaneous. Water freezing at 150 degrees Celsius, that is not spontaneous. And it sounds stupid because it doesn't happen, but that's exactly the definition, right? Things that don't happen are not spontaneous. Things that happen are spontaneous. Does that kind of make sense? So are there any non-spontaneous processes that we would be from, that we would recognize? None that would happen. It's like, so, so no. Never. Correct. Because so, and so here's the other thing that I'll add is that a lot of things happen under certain conditions that don't happen under other conditions. So if I just said water freezes, if I just said water freezing, is that spontaneous? You would say, well, it depends on the conditions that it's in. Does that kind of make sense? And so spontaneity a, in, in a lot of situations is temperature dependent. A lot of things happen at certain temperatures that don't happen at other temperatures. Okay, so tell me if this is a good distinguishing one. So like a spontaneous thing would be like a match burning because once you start, it's not going to stop. Okay. But then like would a non-spontaneous occurrence be like when you're heating a pot of water, like you always have to add the heat to the water, otherwise it doesn't go? Okay, so that's a good question because this is a point of confusion for a lot of people. It depends on what you're defining as your universe. Okay, so let's say I say I have a pot of water. Does that pot boil if I just have a pot of water sitting on my counter? No. But as soon as I say I have a pot of water on a hot stove and that's now my universe, is it now spontaneous for water to boil? Yes. Okay. And then the other example you used was, oh, I can't remember the first thing you said. A match burning. Yeah, a match burning. Okay. So if I have a match, these are really good. These are really good questions. This is why I wanted you guys here. Okay. So if I have a match, if I have a match, does it burn? No, so just a match sitting on its own, burning a match is not a spontaneous process. But as soon as I say um, I've ignited that match and I just have a little flame and that's my universe, is it now spontaneous for it to, 
burn. Yes. I don't keep burning. Yes. So that's why I said the conditions matter. And so it depends on how you define your universe. So a classic, a classic, maybe it's even on here, or maybe it's on the next problem set. It's on the next problem set. A classic um, one that causes debate amongst students um, and is this one. Um, what does it say? Cup muffins in the oven rise or muffins rise in the oven. Okay, spontaneous or not? Well, why do we know about the conditions? Okay, so that's exactly perfect. That was the question I wanted you to ask. So really what we're asking, whenever we say is this spontaneous or not, we're asking does this happen or not? That's as complicated as it is. Does this happen or not? Muffins in the oven rise. Well, the real question that Ben asked was, well, is the oven on or not? Okay, so if we're assuming that the oven is on, Okay, then is it spontaneous? Certain. Yeah. And you'll hear people that say, well, but that oven is just a constant addition of energy. Well, th if, that was, if, if that was enough to say that it wasn't spontaneous because the oven was adding energy, then like nothing that's endothermic would ever be spontaneous, right? Because to melt something, energy has to be added, right? So that's not enough. Anyway, I'm trying to break down a debate that you might hear, except none of you talk to other students, so you never hear debates and other students claiming stuff is wrong. So well, <laughs> anyway, so muffins in the oven rise. Well, it depends. Is the oven on? That's spontaneous. Is the oven off? Not spontaneous. Does that feel okay? Question. Uh -huh. If you have a non-spontaneous reaction, could you make it spontaneous by increasing the entropy around it? Yes. Well, hold on. If you have a non-spontaneous by increasing the entropy around it. Yes. So that's exactly, let, let me that's talk about how that, that's what happened with the oven, right? So ovens rising just on them on their own, that's not spontaneous. But as soon as I increase the entropy around it by increasing the temperature of the surroundings, okay, then all of a sudden we're good because, okay, yeah. Let me answer that question in the form of addition, something adding on here. So delta S of the universe has to be greater than zero. Delta S of the universe is equal to delta S of the system. If there's no subscript, that's always system. Plus delta S of the surroundings. So this needs to be positive. So muffins rising has negative entropy. And we'll talk about why in a second. So when is the delta, when is it going to become spontaneous? Only if the delta S of the universe is, or of the surroundings is big and positive, right? It's gotta be bigger than this. And so at high temperatures, it is big and positive, right? At low temperatures, it's not necessarily big and positive. Cool? Yeah. Okay, let's move on and I'll be able to answer more of your questions as we move on. All right, so that's not what I wanted to erase. I just wanted to erase this this okay all right let's talk about the third law of thermodynamics and that is that the actual entropy so this is s not delta s but just the value for entropy equals zero for a perfect crystal at zero kelvin how many ways can you arrange a perfect crystal? Well, by definition, a perfect crystal means everything is arranged exactly the correct way. Does that make sense? So there's a perfect crystal. How many ways could you arrange it? One way. One way. Okay. Now, um, the number of ways we can arrange something is called a microstate, which we represent as W. You're never going to do math with this, but just to show you. Um, the number of microstates is called W. This is where he was doing all of the probability stuff, exactly. right? Exactly. Yep. Yep. And entropy is defined as K, which is a constant LN W. So if there's only one way to arrange a perfect crystal, W equals one. And what's LN of one? LN yeah. of one is zero. So entropy is zero if there's only one way to arrange something. 
Kelvin. So that's why entropy is zero for a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin for two reasons. One, there's only one way to arrange it. And two, everything has its absolute minimum amount of energy. So you can't reorganize the energy because nothing can afford to give anything away because everything has its absolute minimum. All right. So those are our three laws of thermodynamics. There's a little explanation of entropy. Um, let me see. We answered those. Okay. Awesome. So now the question comes in, how the heck do we figure out like if one thing has more or less entropy than another, and then how do we actually calculate the entropy of something? Um, and before we go there, let me say one more thing about the third law. Entropy equals zero for a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. Do you remember when we did delta H as a formation and we said delta H of formation of a pure element is zero? Remember talking about that? You guys are like barely. Is that like when uh, you're just adding straight oxygen to the reaction? Yeah, so if my, my reaction was like CH4 plus O2 goes to CO2 plus H2O, and I did products minus reactants, the O2 is just zero because it's a pure element. Okay, so delta H is a formation for a pure element are zero, but our entropy values for your pure element zero. And the answer is no, because when is entropy zero? For a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. Oh. Oxygen at, at, at normal conditions is not a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. So pure elements have entropy values. Okay. And we'll see that later on in this problem set, but I just wanted to, because I'll relate back to that again later. So I wanted to mention it now. Okay. What are some things that can affect entropy? Okay. I'll say how to increase entropy. Okay, I'm going to uh, rank these from having the most effect to the least effect. Was that, Ben, did you say something? Yeah, so some of the factors that I have written down are number of moving particles and the volume. Okay, cool. So number two, I'm going to say number of particles. Hey, Google, cancel. Something I said made my Google Home think I said something. Okay. Um, so number of particles is number two. Can anybody think about number one? Temperature? Not quite. The, mass. Uh, what was that? Heat. Mass. Okay, number mass is going to be right here. Or I'm just going to say size. Number one is the phase. What? Mm. What has more entropy, a solid or a gas? Gas. Gas, absolutely. A gas is way more dispersed and disordered, and there's way more ways to arrange gas particles than solid particles, right? So the phase is, has the biggest effect. So that's the first thing to look at when you're trying to compare, like in a react, like we're going to come over here and we're going to like compare in a reaction, does entropy go up or down? First thing to look at is phase. So is energy, is energy or temperature or heat not on this list? So we're getting there. Okay. okay. Um, this is kind of what to look at in a, like looking at a reaction. I'm just trying to give you the order of things to look at. Um, oh. And so I'm not going to include everything on the list that could change the entropy. All right. So after the phase, let's say that they're gas before and they're gas after, then I look at the number of particles. Okay. So if I increase in number of particles, obviously I can arrange them more ways, right? If I have one particle, there's only one way I can arrange it. But if I have two, there's two ways. If I have three, there's more than that. Six ways. Yeah. Anyway. So then I look at the number of particles. Um, another way to think about that is if things are splitting up, obviously they're getting more disordered. And then lastly, um, the size of the particles. So what has more entropy, a helium molecule or a pentane molecule? Thing. Which one can be dis which one can be arranged in more ways? Yeah, Caroline, I saw your mouth say pentane, even though your microphone is muted. Pentane. There you go. Take the credit. Right? Because think of it, this this helium is just like an atom. It's just floating around. There's not really many ways I can manipulate it. 
but pentane, I could like bend it like that. Is that now arranged differently in space? Yeah, it can flip around, I guess is what I'm saying. And the more it can flip around, the more the energy is dispersed through space. And so bigger molecules have greater entropy. So if you had like a helium and a neon molecule just chilling. I would say the neon, neon, because neon's a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's not, so it can be the size of the molecule and the size of the atom. Yeah. I mean, neon, in the case of neon, that's the entire molecule, right? It's just an atom. Okay. What about now if I had this? Now, these are the same molar mass. What has more entropy? Is it still the one on the left? It is. Can you explain why? Well, I was kind of just thinking of it. It's just like more spread out. Yeah. There's, and it, it's less it's less rigid and where it has to be, if that makes sense. This one is defining where everything is connected more than this one is. You can think the extreme case would be like if I, I moved and I did uh, this, if that has even fewer ways to be arranged because everything is being told where it's being connected and there's not as much bending and flipping around that can happen. Cool? Okay. Um, now some other things that can affect entropy. Um, just, I'm gonna put like a space here and just make some notes. So um, I think Ben said volume, right? If I have a bigger volume, things can spread out more. Um, and I think, was it Samuel that said temperature? Okay, if I have a higher temperature, things are gonna be moving faster, dispersing energy better. They're gonna be more disordered because they're moving around faster. Okay, you guys following? So there's a lot of other things that we could talk about. Um, but that might come up on case to case basis, but you just need to think, does this make things more ordered or less ordered? That's the question you're asking. Okay. So let's do some of these right here. Which component in each of the following pairs has greater entropy? One mole of S2 or one mole of S8? What do you think? I'm thinking S8. Yeah, can you walk us through it? Um, it's four times larger. Okay, so, so it's I'm bigger. A, I'm imagining right. like more electrons spinning. Cool. So it, yeah. yeah, it's bigger. It can be flipped around in, in a lot of different ways. Now, going through here, the first thing we look at is phase, and they're the same phase. Then I look at the number of particles. Well, I've got 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of both of them. So that doesn't help me. So then I would look at the size. And yeah, S8 is big. It actually, let's see if I can draw it. It actually forms an eight-membered ring. And you can imagine, imagine you had a ring like that, that was like connects or something. Um, you can like bend it around and twist it and stuff. Versus S2, there's not much you can do with that, right? So, cool, perfect. All right, one mole of S2 gas or one mole of S8 solid? S2 gas. For sure, okay? Because gases are always, doesn't matter how much of you, well, I'm sure at some point it matters, but for you guys, it doesn't matter how much of it you have. If you've got a gas, that's got more entropy than a solid. More disordered, okay. Um, one mole of O2 gas or one mole of O3 gas? Well, this is just like A, right? Mm -hmm. Same phase, same number of particles. So it just goes down to size. One gram of O2 gas, one gram of O3 gas. Gram of O3. Why? Uh, part, uh, size of the particle. Yeah, but what about the number of particles? But Aren't they the same because they're both one gram? But they're both one gram, but their molar masses are different. So, Ooh. So it's like if I were to say if you have... Um, and this isn't a trick question. If you have a pound of bricks and a pound of feathers, do you have more bricks or do you have more quantity of feathers? You have more quantity of feathers. Exactly. You have more particles of feathers because each of them is lighter. So mm -hmm. if I have the same mass of them, I must have more feathers. So I've got the same mass of O2 and O3, but O2 is lighter. And so I'm going to have so more particles more of, of O2. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, just kind of a, yep, cool. All right, let's just keep going. 
predict whether the entropy of the system increases or decreases in the following reactions. We're looking at the same stuff, okay? Same stuff here. Water liquid to water gas, that's a phase thing. So that's gonna be gas. So entropy is positive. Delta S is positive, entropy increases. Okay, a solid going to aqueous, aqueous. So first off, phase. Aqueous is more disordered. That's like dissolved in water. That's gonna be more disordered. So entropy is gonna increase. I could also go and look at number of particles. I'm going from two part or one particle to two. That allows more disorder. Are you okay if I just walk through them like this? Yeah. Yeah. Just stop me if you if it doesn't make sense. All right. Um, iron solid plus oxygen gas goes to iron oxide solid. Okay. Phase. I've got a gas. I've got only solids. So that entropy is going down. Gas and gas goes to gas. So phase doesn't work. Number of particles, I've got one, two here, and two here. So number of particles doesn't work. Size of particles, this is two nitrogens, two oxygens. Okay, so more, more of the story is I have no idea um, based on our breakdown techniques. So I think the key actually says close to zero. I have a quick question, Jeremy. Uh -huh. So when you asked about the number of particles for that one on, on D, you said the N2 just counts yeah. as its own particle itself, and the yep. O2 is its separate particle? Yes, yeah, so I've got an N2 molecule, I've got an O2 mm -hmm. molecule, and they're coming and they together, to two NO. and they're making an NO and an NO. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Yeah. And those particles are pretty close in size, right? And so because of that, based on our techniques, without numbers, we don't know. So just close to zero is fine. So what numbers gas. would oh, go ahead. you be looking for? We're going to, I'll show you later. We're going to do something okay. first. Yeah. Not only going to be positive, solid to gas. Solid gas to solid is going to be negative. Gas, gas to solid is going to be negative. And lastly, gas, gas to gas. And look at the number of particles. One, two, three, down to two. So that's getting more ordered. I'm taking, you know, three Lego blocks and combining them into two Lego blocks. And so that's becoming more ordered, so entropy is going down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Haiti's smiling and shaking her head because she really likes Legos. I'm with Haiti. You're with Haiti? Yeah. Nice. I like Legos. All right. So now we're going to do some more conceptual stuff. We're making great progress. Good job, guys. We're going to do some more conceptual stuff um, here. So in this case, we're going to try and talk about the system, the surroundings, and then the universe. So we'll talk about what does it mean for each of those things. So first off, the system. Um, ice, well, I could read the question. Ice cube melts in a glass of lemonade, cooling the lemonade from 10 to zero degrees. The ice cubes are the system. What's the sign for delta S of the system, surroundings, and universe? All right, first the system, the ice cubes. Entropy-wise, what's happening to the ice cubes? They're melting. Yeah, so that's a phase change. So their entropy is going up, right? And it goes from a solid to a liquid. Perfect. Good job. Okay, and now the surroundings. What's hap what is the surroundings? The lemonade. Yep, and what's happening to that? Well, the volume's increasing because there's more, I guess, liquid in it after the ice cubes melt. Okay, she's like overthinking this. <laughs> oh, no. It's cooling what down. does the problem tell you happens to lemonade? It's cooling down. It's getting colder. Yeah. You could think of, right, the lemonade's cooling from 10 to zero. So to negate what Catherine said, we've got an ice cube in lemonade. Okay, so if you think of that ice cube as the system, then even after it melts, like part of that liquid is, is the system and the rest is still the surrounding. So the amount of lemonade that counts as the surroundings doesn't really change. Does that kind of make sense what I'm saying? Yeah. But you don't need to think about it that hard. You just need to say lemonade goes from 10 to zero degrees. So it's cooling down. And what happens to entropy when it cools down? Does it go down? It does because things are getting less disordered. They're moving around slower. Okay. And then what's about delta S of the universe? What does delta S of the universe tell us? It has to be greater than zero, right? It has to be positive. If. If it's spontaneous. Yep. So, so the question we're asking is, does this right. happen? When you put ice cubes in 10 degree lemonade, do they melt? 
ants? Yep, for sure. 10 degrees Celsius. That's above melt freezing point. So yep, that happens. So that says the universe must be positive. Okay. So could you figure it out reverse? Like you could figure out like the system of the universe by just looking at the problem instead of like thinking, oh, the surroundings in the system are... Yeah, we, didn't, we did not need to do this to figure out this. Okay. And even if we did, it doesn't even tell us, right? We've got a positive and a negative. So we don't know if that make, adds up to a positive or negative, but we just asked ourselves, does, does ice melt in lemonade? And the answer is yes, so it's positive. All right, adding side, sidewalk de-icer, calcium chloride, which is a salt, it's an ionic compound, so they, they call it a salt over here, to water causes the salt to dissolve and the temperature of the water to increase. Okay, the salt, CaCl2 is the system. So what's the sign of delta? System surroundings universe. Okay, system first. What positive. is it? Positive, why? Because the salt dissolves into a liquid. Yep. Right? It goes from a solid to a liquid? Uh, not quite a liquid, aqueous though. The solution? Yeah, into the solution. So same idea, but it's, it's exactly like this one right here. We've got a salt that dissolves into aqueous, which is less ordered. And so that's going to be positive. Sure. The so surroundings. What would, Go ahead. Sorry, what, would, what would you say about like an aqueous to a liquid? How, how would, is that like I impossible? think aqueous to a liquid yeah. is Oh, good question. Um, you're never going to see it, but I would think that I would think liquid is less ordered. But yeah, you're not going to see that because that doesn't really happen where something melts when it's dissolved in liquid or in water. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So delta S of the surroundings then. Is the surroundings the water? Yeah. I'm thinking that the entropy goes up because you're spinning it around, mixing it. Now there's more things in it. Okay. So also the you're correct that it goes increases? up, but the reason is because the temperature increases. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then lastly, two ways to think about this. If delta S of the system is positive and delta S of the surroundings is positive, is delta S of the universe positive? Yeah, it has to be, because that's just the sum of the system and the surroundings. Uh, the other way to think about it is, again, delta S of the universe tells us if something is spontaneous. So we have to ask ourselves, does it actually happen? Does de-icer melt ice on the road? It does. Yes. And therefore, this is positive, and, or it's spontaneous, so it's positive. I'm, I have another question, Jeremy. Uh -huh. um, so if we had a different problem, but let's say that the temperature cause the water to decrease? Would that make the surroundings negative then? Yeah, and that like... was this example up here, right? The lemonade okay. cooled from 10 to zero, so the surroundings cool. was negative. Okay, perfect. So temperature is like a, a big factor. Yes, it can be a big factor, yep. Okay. So I have a question about cause, mm -hmm. like the calcium chloride causing the water temperature to increase. Yep. So, so if the ions are more attracted to the water than they are each other you're breaking the ion bonds and you're creating a bunch of hydrogen bonds is that is that releasing energy into the water so you're breaking hydrogen bonds and you're breaking ion ion to form ion dipole right right and so yeah so the the idea is um, maybe I would draw that ion dipole a little bit lower. So your net, your net is going to a lower energy state. And so that's going to release energy into the water, which is going to heat it up. What if it was a net higher energy state? Yeah. So, so there's something that we don't talk about in 105 and you won't talk about ever because you're not taking 106. But if you were to take 106, um, you would learn what we call the solubility rules, which mm. define which ionic compounds dissolve in water and which don't. And so some things do have a net positive, and so they don't dissolve. They literally won't dissolve in water. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. So like, have you ever tried to, this is more of a tangent, so shut me up if necessary. But like, so if you're in a rush. Like magnesium, I think, like a 
a long time ago, I bought some like magnesium sulfate salt or whatever to soak my foot in. Uh huh. And like I dump a bunch of salts in the water and then I, like I'd always end up with a bunch of salt crystals at the bottom. Yep. They're just like too saturated or is the so that net... in that case? Yes. So um, everything is soluble up to a point, right? Even mm -hmm. salt like table salt will only dissolve up to a point uh, because after that it stops being a net negative entropy. All of a sudden the entropy of the surroundings and the entropy of system don't balance out to a positive, but but there are some things that are very, very insoluble, right? Iron, if I drop iron in water, it doesn't dissolve, right? Um, because it, it wouldn't be a net. Delta S of the universe would not be positive. Okay. okay. All right, let's keep going. Particular reaction is spontaneous. Delta S of the reaction is negative 163 joules per K. What must be true about delta S of the surroundings? Well, what does this sentence tell us? I just underline. What does that tell us? It's the, like, the energy of the universe is greater than zero. The entropy. The, oh, the entropy. entropy. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So we know that delta S of the universe equals delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. They tell us this one is positive. In other words, delta S plus delta S of the surroundings has to be greater than zero. Yeah. And then they tell us delta S of the reaction, which is the system, is negative 163. So what must be true about delta S of the surroundings? It has to be greater than 163. Yep, and I can show that. That can just make sense in your head, but I can show it mathematically. If I add the 163 over, delta S of the surroundings must be greater than 163. And I guess I should add units, joules per Kelvin. Okay. Okay. Now I need to, before we can move on, it's time to show you how we do some of this stuff mathematically. Okay. So we've just done this conceptually. There's two things, two ways to calculate delta S. Well, so far there's two ways to calculate delta S. One is if we have a reversible process. And he kind of defined what that meant today, I think. Um, but basically what you should think for reversible is I'm adding heat to something, but the temperature is not changing. Okay, add heat, change in temperature zero. So can you think of an example, a situation that we've talked about where you add heat, but the temperature doesn't change? Phase change. Phase change. Remember our heating curve? Bam, 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 bam. Here I'm adding heat, but the temperature doesn't change. Okay, so if I'm at uh, like a phase, so I'm gonna write that here. Phase change is one example of that. Okay, so you're gonna use this for phase changes. The other example is when you're talking about the surroundings. I'm gonna say big surroundings. So for example, if I light a campfire, that's releasing heat into the atmosphere, right? But does my campfire change the temperature of the atmosphere? No, pretty much no, right? Because the surroundings are so big. Okay. So in these two cases, we call these reversible processes, and there's other reversible processes as well, but these are the two that you're gonna encounter. Okay. If I'm releasing or absorbing heat from the big surroundings, right? Or if I'm at a, at a phase change, then delta S is really easy to calculate. It's just the heat of my process, the heat going like into or out of my surroundings or into or out of my phase change, divided by the temperature I'm at. I could also write this as delta H over T. Um, but remember, this is the delta H of like the, sur the, sur the thing I'm talking about, the surroundings of the phase change. Okay. You'll also see this written, I think it's on your equation sheet, as Q reversible over T. Okay, and so that should remind you that you can only use this in certain conditions, and these are really the, the two cases that you'll encounter. Okay, so before I talk about the second way that we calculate delta S, let's apply this. A particular reaction releases 25 kilojoules of heat into the surroundings, which are 27 degrees Celsius. 
if this reaction is spontaneous, remember that just gave us some information, right? If it's spontaneous, that means delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings has to be greater than zero. How does this limit the possible value for delta S of the reaction? All right, so we've got some reaction. That's what we're trying to find. We need to get information about delta S of the surroundings. Well, this is a situation where we're just releasing heat into the ether, right? And it's not changing the temperature. It tells us the, te the surroundings are 27 degrees. We're just releasing 25 kilojoules into them. So we can say, because we're talking about big surroundings, that delta S of the surroundings equals Q of the surroundings over temperature of the surroundings. Well, what's Q of my surroundings? 25 kilojoules. Positive or negative? Hmm. Negatives. I, I kind of want to say it's positive. I don't know. But... Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's hear both cases. Samuel? So I'm on team negative because it's releasing the heat. Okay. And team Ben? <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Wait. So, this doesn't do release heat into the atmosphere, and that's exothermic. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it should be negative. positive. Yeah. So the, the heat of the of the reaction, the system, is a is a negative value because heat's being released from the system. But we're finding delta S of the surroundings. I know you can't uh -huh. read that, but it should say surroundings. Okay. So we need Q of the surroundings. Well, the heat of the surrounding heat's going into the surroundings. Oh. So in this case, that would be positive. So I, can you say can you say that again? Not uh -huh. because you cut out, but I couldn't process it fast yep. enough. So a particular reaction releases 25 kilojoules of heat. So delta H of the reaction is negative 25 kilojoules. You are correct in that sense. Mm -hmm. okay, but we're finding delta S of the surroundings. So we need Q of the surroundings. Okay. Delta H of the reaction or the system is negative 25. Delta H of the surroundings then must be positive 25 because heat's leaving the reaction into the surroundings. Okay. So talking about the surroundings, surroundings is absorbing heat, 25 kilojoules, over a temperature of 300 Kelvin. And that gives me a number. So okay. would the reaction that releases 24 kilojoules of heat, would that be exothermic yeah okay. all right so there's my entropy of my surroundings okay because again two situations a phase change or big surroundings big surroundings what we're doing so we found the heat going into the surroundings divided by the temperature of the surroundings and we got the entropy of the surroundings and he was saying today that the temperature for entropy is always in kelvin right yeah yeah Yep. Okay, so we should always convert that. Because otherwise you could end up dividing by zeros here and stuff. So we, we want to use Kelvin. Okay. Okay, so now we have delta S of the system plus 0 0.0833 kilojoules per Kelvin is greater than zero. So that means that the delta S of my reaction must be greater than negative 0 0.0833. So very similar to the last problem, except they made you calculate one of your entries. Okay, do you guys want to do another one like this? Yeah. Okay, mercury is a liquid at room temperature. It freezes at this temperature. What is the entropy change when 50 grams of mercury freezes if the enthalpy of fusion is 2.29 kilojoules per mole? All right, so what type of situation is this? What's happening here? I'm trying to calculate the entropy change for a phase change. Oh, so it's uh, the equations we already talked about. Yeah, okay, because phase changes, as long as we're at the temperature of the phase change, then that's considered a reversible process. So then we, I should have put more space here. Then we say delta S of this process is gonna be Q of this process over T of the process. How are we gonna find the total heat for this process?
Anybody remember how to calculate so, the heat of a phase change? Well, we have the enthalpy of diffusion, and we have the mass of the mercury, so you can calculate how many moles of mercury we have. Right. Perfect. For a phase change, Q is N delta H. That's the total heat for this process. So I've got my 50 grams of mercury. One mole of mercury is 200 grams, which gives me 0 0.25 moles. Okay. So my total heat is going to be my 0 0.25 moles. My enthalpy of fusion, but am I, am I fusing? What is fusion? Uh, freezing, right? Fusion is actually melting. Oh, yeah. You can remember because it's positive, right? I add heat to melt. So I need to use the negative value because I'm not melting, I'm freezing. Divided by the temperature of my phase change, which is negative 38.9 plus 273 to 34.1 Kelvin. Okay, so because it's a phase change, I just need to find out my heat of my process divided by the temperature of my process. I got an entropy change of negative 0 0.0024 kilojoules per kelvin. Should it be negative? Yeah. Why? Well, I'm just thinking about like my fridge. If I want something to get cold, I'm pumping a lot of power into my fridge to make it cold, which means somewhere else I'm burning a bunch of stuff to make power. Okay. So like it could like this could happen if we're increasing entropy somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. But you could have situations where you have a positive entropy in one side and a positive entry on system and surroundings. Is it because it's non spontaneous? Because mercury is liquid at room temperature? Okay, so thanks for saying that. So that's not true, but I'm glad you said it because I was waiting for somebody to ask a question like this. You said it's non spontaneous because that's negative, right? Yeah. Okay, but second law of thermodynamics says delta S of the universe has to be positive, not the system. We're talking about the system here. Okay, so this does, this does not at all mean that it's not spontaneous, okay? It should be negative because I'm freezing my liquid, my mercury. It's going from liquid to solid, right? And that's a phase change, right? That's going to lower entropy. So if you had a bunch of mercury sitting by itself at negative 38.9 degrees Celsius, would it stay liquid? Um, so it could be a liquid at negative 38.9 or a solid at negative 38.9. And that's exactly what makes it a reversible process because any slight change will, will switch the process in the other direction. Um, just like you can have water at zero degrees Celsius or you can have water at a, at, or ice at zero degrees Celsius. Okay, but at but any point the, below this temperature, it's gonna freeze. At any point above this temperature, it's definitely gonna be a liquid. So if it was at a lower temperature, then, well, the, your final answer would still be negative. You'd still have negative kilojoules per Kelvin. So if I like, feel like if the mercury is just all by itself, at negative 30 degrees Celsius, how is it going to freeze if the entropy is building? You mean negative like 40? Lower yeah, than negative. So negative 40. Mm -hmm. Again, this does not say that this process is not spontaneous. This is delta S of the system. Delta S of the system does not tell you about whether or not something's going to happen. Delta S of the universe does. Oh. And okay. so if we started, if we said, well, what if we go below this to like negative 40 degrees Celsius? Well, that changes the temperature of the surroundings, which changes the entropy of the surroundings, which then could make it positive. But this will always, something freezing will always have negative entropy. Going from liquid to a solid will always have negative entropy. The question is, how does the surroundings affect the universe? And that's why at different surroundings temperatures, things become spontaneous or not. And we're gonna talk a lot more about temperature dependency when we 
get more into delta G, which he introduced today. Okay, so that's one way to calculate entropy. Q over T for a reversible process. Okay, but for anything, even if it is reversible for any process, um, one way to calculate delta S is S final minus S initial. For a reaction, what do we call final stuff? Products. Products. What do you call initial stuff? Reactants. Okay, so just like when we did delta H as a formation, we did products minus reactants. Okay, so it's the same equation. And if you want to stop listening to me there, because it'll get you that answer, that's fine. Okay, same equation, but for a very different reason. Okay. Remember with, with delta H is a formation, okay, that's like the energy it takes to form one mole of something from its pure elements, right? But S values are not delta S's, right? These are literally, because for S, we know what zero is for S, right? It's a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin. And so we can actually just get a number, not a delta S, a formation for, for oxygen. We can just get the amount of entropy for oxygen. Okay, but at the, at the end of the day, it's still products minus reactions, just final minus initial. Catherine, are you laughing at me? She's not even listening. Okay. Um, anyway, so if we have like a reaction, we can look up the S values, which you can look up in appendix four of your book. Um, then, then, uh, then we can just do products minus reactants. So let's do it. Um, we don't have to do both of them. We'll just do one of them. The following reaction plays a key role in the destruction of ozone in the atmosphere. The standard entropy change for this reaction, so this is the delta S of the reaction, is 19.9 joules per mole Kelvin. Use the standard molar entropies, just S values, from appendix four in your book to find the S value for this one. Okay, so we're going to look up the S values for the other stuff, and you you can just look it up in your book. I'm just looking it up on the key. Um, so we're looking for CLO. Oxygen is 205 joules per mole Kelvin. Oh, sorry, that's oxygen. Okay, remember, this is a pure element, but it's not, S values for pure elements are not zero. Delta ages of formation are zero, but S values are not. Okay, O3 is 238.8 joules per mole Kelvin, and Cl2 is 223 joules per mole Kelvin. Okay, you could just look up ClO in your book as well, but we're trying to find it, so I'm not gonna look it up. All right, so we know the overall process is 19.9, and that's just gonna be my products minus my reactants. All right, so my products are gonna be ClO, or I should say S naught of CLO plus my 205 minus my reactants, one half of 223 plus 238.8. And that I got the S naught of CLO is 170. Okay, so that's a different way to find S. You can do that for any process, um, as long as you have the S values. And that is entropy. Questions about that? Not specifically about entropy, but can you quickly go over how to determine where, when something is the system or the surrounding? How we define the system or surrounding? Yeah, so good question. So if it's a problem, um, like here, usually the system is just the first thing they mention. Ice cubes, system. Salt walk, sidewalk de-icer, system. Um, 
mercury system. And then if they don't mention what the surroundings is, like with the lemonade problem, they told you about the surroundings. The lemonade cools from 10 to zero. They don't tell you, just assume it's just the rest of the world. Um, but here's another rule of thumb, a reaction, that's always gonna be the system. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. No, that was perfect, yeah. Okay. Just mostly the, the thing that reacts is, is exactly the, system. the thing that goes through whatever process we are talking about that's the system okay perfect. Yep. anything else is your baby this a boy or a girl <laughs> my baby is a boy his name's spencer excellent he is now two days and a few hours old does he have a middle name jeremy oh yep Everybody in my family and Rachel's family says that he looks like me. And then they also say he's cute. And I just say, well, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Wow, good work. Yep. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to post this one on YouTube. And then I'm going to spend today finishing the rest of the YouTube videos for the semester. Is now a good time to ask dumb proctorio questions? Uh, yeah, let me stop sharing. Well, I guess it's restation. Go ahead. Yeah. So... If like if I have a hard time focusing, oh there we go. If I have a hard time focusing during tests and my eyes like to wander all over the place anyway, is that a bad time to do so during the proctorio? Um, so you should try as much as you can to let your eyes wander all over your screen. Um, okay. Now, obviously, things are going to be weird because you guys are going to have equation sheets and you're going to be writing stuff down, you know, and so. Obviously, there's going to be some, I don't know, leeway. So the, here, here's the worst thing that Proctorio does. It flags you, and I believe like it, it then I, as a TA, can go see all of the clips that got flagged. Okay, so if your girlfriend comes over and you start making out during the test, then it flags it, and then I, as a TA, go back, and I, I'm the one who decides that's okay or not. Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense. Um, so I just say that because I always, I had a class with Proctorio and I always just wanted to just make out with my wife during the test just for fun. I never did. Anyway, so like um, people have asked about like, you know, I don't really have a quiet place in my house that I can just do this, you know, or I've got siblings that are going to be running around. And like at the end of the day, we're going to look at it and see it and say, oh, I'm pretty sure that they're cheating or I think they're fine, you know? Mm. So that's, that's what I would say to that. Plus you get a note card. So like, it's, it's not like you, if you had prepared a bunch of cheating materials and hung them up around your room so that you could look at them, like you could have just written them on your note card. So I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. It seems kind of silly to, cheat when you already have something in your hand. So. so the things that Proctorio really will help prevent is it takes over your computer screen. So you can't open any other windows. And so it'll prevent that. Um, and then it will prevent people like, so that, that'll prevent people from maybe their video chatting, taking the test together, um, which could have been a concern on the last test, right? But it'll also prevent people from Ooh. sitting next to each other, taking the test with each other, right? Because if I'm talking about things with you, I don't know. It'd be pretty um, obvious if you're constantly looking, looking over, the side. you know, so that, and, and that's different than, that's different than like your eyes wandering around your room. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So we're not, I mean, that we're not trying sense. to like rip anybody apart, but honestly, not just putting it on Proctorio. Yeah, exactly. Honestly, okay. putting it on Proctorio is, you know, 98% of the battle. It's going to stop 98% of the cheating just by putting in some system. Okay. So that's what I'd say to that. I wouldn't, I really wouldn't stress too much about it. People are like, what about going and getting bathroom breaks? I'm like, well, well, what I wanted to say in the message was if you just start the test sitting on the toilet, then you're set because then you wouldn't have to leave. But uh, I didn't say that because I didn't want to be mean. Well, oh, that's so, funny though. Yeah. As for your comment, that was golden. I, I felt really good about that. <laughs> I felt bad for telling Dr. Asplund to like stop in the middle of a PowerPoint slide to read it. 
but it was funny. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It's only funny because like at the beginning of quarantine, I had two classes that were sitting at like an 80%. Uh huh. And, and one of them pushed all the deadlines back to the end of the semester. <laughs> one of them kept with the regular schedule. So my first class has gone up to like a 87 and the other one's dropped down to like the low 70s. It's a, what's they call it? A zero sum game, right? If one yeah. goes up, the other goes down. Yeah. Good times. Yep. 